Um, so what I'm going to cover is going through um, someone who's needing to have an autologous stem cell transplant. Um, and we will look at um, who can actually have a transplant, uh, go through the collection, collecting the stem cell process, and then look at the person heading in for the stem cell transplant. Um, now that can either be in hospital or some of it can be done as an outpatient depending on what hospital you go to but largely most of the patients will be in hospital for that stem cell transplant phase. And then we'll talk, talk about after the transplant in that um, immediate days following a transplant. And then also looking at sort of looking ahead um, and what happens in those first couple of months after the transplant has been completed. So that's what we'll step through. So if we just look at who can actually have a transplant. So Stem cell transplants, um, there's actually three types of transplants that can be given. Um, there is autologous, where we actually collect a patient's own stem cells and then store those away to be reinfused on another day. There can be an allogeneic transplant, um, where we actually use a, um, a donor stem cells. Now that could be a brother or sister um, or a relative within a family, or it's someone from an actual donor register. We won't actually be talking a lot about allogeneic transplant today. This is really focusing on autologous stem cell transplant. And then there's also um, another type of transplant if you're lucky enough to have an identical twin. Um, but that's very reserved for a very few people. Now you will hear some terms um, interchange when you read literature or you hear people talking about um, transplant. But basically, they're really all meaning the same thing. A stem cell transplant um, is really just talking about the types of cells that we're transplanting. They can either be collected from a, the bone marrow, um, so actually having needles going into the, the backs of the hips to collect those stem cells, or they can actually be collected peripherally, and um, that's where a person goes onto the, a machine and has those cells collected peripherally. And that's probably the most common way stem cells are collected now for a stem cell transplant. So what are the different conditions that can have an autologous stem cell transplant? So probably one of the most common ones is multiple myeloma. And the reason for that was there were some studies done um, very early on in multiple myeloma because we didn't have a lot of success with standard treatment. And we actually found that the patients that were given high dose chemotherapy and then a stem cell transplant, that they had a better response rate and they also had a better survival rate and outcome from having that transplant process. And that has still been the same today and in actual fact I now know patients who have had their transplant and are 8 and 10 years down the path and have not had any relapse from their myeloma. Um, so transplant has certainly sort of changed the way myeloma um, is sort of being treated. There have been some studies that have looked at tandem transplants. So there are some doctors who do consider patients with multiple myeloma where they actually give two transplants. Now that's usually reserved for people where they've got an initial response with the first transplant, but their disease hasn't totally gone into remission. So they're considered to, you know, is a second transplant worthwhile to have. So, but it's not considered for everyone. Another thing that's actually come along in the last sort of five years or so is actually the timing of transplant in myeloma patients. What we've found now is that there is a lot of new, newer agents that are being used to treat myeloma. So the question of what is the role of transplant um, is really starting to be raised. So there are some studies that are, are around that are looking at, you know, do we still need to do a transplant in everyone with multiple myeloma? or could we just rely on these newer agents? But that's very much in a research sort of phase at the moment. Then we look at the condition lymphoma. Um, now lymphoma is quite a diverse group of malignancies um, and we actually have people who can be um, given non-Hodgkin's lymphoma or they actually have Hodgkin's lymphoma. There's differing behaviour and responses to treatment according to the type of lymphoma a person has. And that is what will actually guide and govern whether a doctor actually says that you're someone who needs to actually have a transplant as part of your treatment process. And it's usually people who have got high risk disease, 
or have relapsed disease and so that we know that their disease is playing up so there's someone that's going to need a transplant. How lymphoma patients are collected um, is also quite unique. So they can actually have their collections after say two or three cycles when the doctor knows that that disease has gone into remission and it's just using their standard treatment that they're having as well as a growth factor to go ahead and collect those stem cells. Or it could be something that's done at the end of the treatment um, and you're just putting it away for a rainy day. So they're not actually going to consider transplant a part of that initial treatment, but they wanna store the stem cells because they think that this might be a lymphoma that could play up in the future. Um, and so that decision of whether a person proceeds to transplant is very much based on their, the sort of features of their disease and how their disease has been behaving and responding to the treatment. Um, and lymphoma is a disease that is really um, sort of been increasing in incidence um, and we really don't know what causes it. And we're really starting to do a lot of studies to try and work out what's the best treatment for all the different types of lymphoma. Um, so it's very hard when someone says, I've got lymphoma and what's going to happen to me because it's very much based on the type of lymphoma that a person has. So it makes it quite hard. Um, and we're probably going to see more of it as well. Then finally, we have a condition called amyloidosis. Now, this can be diagnosed alone where all they find is um, amyloidosis um, in the person's um, organs, or it could be combined with myeloma. And we actually find that they've got myeloma and plasma cells in the bone marrow, as well as the amyloid um, in the, the peripheral areas of the body. Whether someone actually goes for a stem cell transplant and has stem cells collections is very much dependent on organ involvement um, with the amyloid and that will guide the suitability of the person for transplant. So if someone has got their heart or their kidneys involved with the amyloid, it can actually make it very difficult to actually go through the collection process and also the, the transplant process. So it's very much an individual decision that's made according to the, the person's condition and what they can do for it. The other thing is also whether they have access to the newer agents as well. So if you just have amyloid alone, um, it is actually a lot harder to get access to some of the newer agents that are available that are being used <coughs> to treat myeloma. So sometimes that's where transplant um, becomes um, a sort of frontline feature. And the collection of the cells, if it is amyloid, sometimes can just be pretty well just after diagnosis and it's just treated by just giving the growth factor and then collecting those stem cells and storing them straight away so that they may not actually get chemotherapy um, in that process to collect the stem cells. So just briefly, the other type of transplant that is around is allogeneic transplant. It does have treatment related mortality and that sits around 30%. So that is quite high compared to having an autologous transplant. But there are some newer techniques coming through with allogeneic transplant, which is actually starting to make this a little bit more, um, what's the word, friendly. And it's an option that is being considered to a wider group of people. And the other thing that can happen with myeloma patients is that we are seeing people have their usual treatment for multiple myeloma. They will actually undergo an autologous stem cell transplant. And then if they have a donor available, then they are considered and referred on for an allogeneic transplant. Um, so in that condition, they're sort of getting their two transplants, but the sources of stem cells are actually from their own as well as a donor um, source. So once the doctor's decided that a person is available for transplant, um, we need to go through a process of checking the suitability for a patient to go and have those stem cells <coughs> collected. So there are a number of tests that the doctors um, ask the patient to undergo, and it's sort of checking your heart condition, um, it's checking your lungs, it's checking your kidney function to make sure everything is okay. And then it's also working out what type of a collection is going to happen. Will it be done with chemotherapy um, or will it just be done with GCSF alone? The reason for that is the timing is very different. So if you just get growth factor, um, it's usually on days four, five and six 
you will get your stem cells collected when you're actually given chemotherapy. It can be anywhere from sort of day, day eight, day nine, um, up to day 15, when we're actually looking at collecting the stem cells following that chemotherapy. So the timing and the process of collecting those is very different. But to look at that timing of collections, we need to know that the disease is under control because if we collect stem cells when there's disease still present, um, we know that we've got a contaminated product and that we've got the potential that will reinfuse disease back when we actually give those stem cells back at the time of transplant. We also know that it's usually done within the first 12 months of being diagnosed. So we like to have someone treated, have their disease under control, and then get those stem cells collected as soon as possible and stored away. Is there an age limit? Um, not really. <laughs> There used to be many years ago, but as doctors get older, they know that they'd like to have a transplant themselves, so the age keeps increasing. Um, the eldest person I've seen have an autologous stem cell transplant um, was 81 years old, um, and I hate to tell you, they probably handled the transplant much better than some people in their 40s and 50s. So age is not uh, an excluding factor. It's really dependent on the person, their, their physical condition um, and what their disease is doing and whether they're going to get benefit from having that transplant. So with regards to the storage of stem cells, there is an, a number of stem cells that the doctors usually like to um, have collected. A minimum number of stem cells to um, store is 3 million stem cells um, per collection or per transplant. And then dependent on whether you've got a condition where the doctor might consider, I might want to do more than one transplant, then they'll want to actually try and collect more. But usually one or two collections is enough to collect the required number of stem cells um, to, to freeze away for a patient um, for a rainy day, as well as doing a, a stem cell transplant. Now, if we actually look at the stem cell um, collection, we usually have a collection is stored, and we might actually go back one slide, sorry. You'll have all different types of machines, but essentially your stem cells are collected and are collected and stored in a bag here. Now this is actually a very good picture of a fantastic stem cell collection where you can see a very thick layer of white cells there and in that will be the actual stem cells. So that's what actually comes off a machine. Um, then it goes to the laboratory and it will then actually get split into a number of bags. So usually one collection will get split into two bags, but if it's a very good collection, we may find that that gets um, frozen into three separate bags. So you end up with this smaller um, bag that the stem cells are stored in. They're then flattened and put, put in this tray to actually be frozen away. So we actually need the, the bag and the stem cells all lying flat so that they're frozen evenly. Um, they go into a machine here, which will take them down to about minus 20 degrees Celsius before they actually get transferred over into a, a long-term storage tank, tank, which stores them at about minus 120 degrees Celsius until required. Now, stem cells can be stored indefinitely. Um, and so a lot of hospitals have put together um, where you get sent out a letter every 12 months to update your contact details so they know exactly where you're living and that they know that these stem cells still need to be stored. The reason being is that um, if a person has unfortunately not responded to treatment or is no longer alive, then those stem cells do get taken out of the tank so that we actually have more space um, to keep storing stem cells into the future for people who are alive. Um, so it's always good to make sure that your treating centre knows exactly where you are and that you're alive because stem cells can be um, stored for a very long time. And I have had patients that have even moved into state. Um, so they've just kept their address with their treating centre in their previous state. Um, and then they've actually needed those stem cells. So we've been able to contact that um, treatment centre and actually have the stem cells transferred up to here so that we could go ahead and give that person a transplant. Um, so it is important to keep that information um, with the treatment centre.